So, colleagues, the next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. Uh, in dealing with these amendments, members should have with them the bill as amended at Stage 2, the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division uh, and the period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. After that, there will be a voting period of one minute um, for the... Sorry, therefore I will allow a voting period of one minute for the First Division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. And members should now refer to the marshalled list. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary grouped with Amendments 42, 2, 3 and 4. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I will speak to my amendments on the Bill's guiding principles. Amendments 1 and 3 relate to amendments lodged by Mr Cole Hamilton during Stage, T, stage 2. The duty to ensure appropriate staffing in Section 12 IA already sets out that for the NHS. It is the duty of every health board and the agency to ensure that at all times suitably qualified and competent individuals are working in such numbers are as, as are appropriate for the health, well-being and safety of patients and the provision of safe and high quality health care. And there is an equivalent duty for any person who provides a care service in part three of the, of the bill. Sections two and three of the bill set out that every health board in complying with section 12 IA and any person who provides a care service in complying with section six of the bill must have regard to the guiding principles. As such, the principles and the general duty are intrinsically linked. Those who must follow the general duty must also have regard to the guiding principles in doing so. But as currently word worded, a health board will be legally required to do the same thing twice. I don't want to avoid confusion for those who are expected to understand and carry out the duties set out in the bill, and I would gently suggest that we do not need uh, to put something in uh, legal duties uh, in triplicate in order for them to take effect. So I therefore ask members to support my amendments, which aim to correct this. Amendment 2 is a technical amendment which aims to correct section 11b so that it references those main purposes rather than the main purpose. This shows that there are now two main purposes of staffing for health and care services following Monica Lennon's insertion at stage 2 of subsection 1a2 to ensure the best health care outcomes for service users. Amendment 4 is another technical amendment clarifying that the reference in the definition of standards and outcomes for service users to section 10H of the National Health Service Scotland Act 1978 refers specifically to subsection 1 of that section. This would be consistent with the specific reference to section 10H1 in section 12IB2B of the bill. And I welcome Ms Lennon's Amendment 42 and move Amendment 1 and the others in my name. Thank you very much. And I call uh, Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 42. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 42 seeks to clarify that one of the main purposes of staffing for these services is to ensure the best health or care outcomes for service users. The aim of my original amendments at stage two um, was to ensure that the guiding principles placed a necessary focus on achieving the best outcomes for service users in a position I'm sure we can all agree on. I have welcomed the further discussions that have taken place to enhance this principle. Amendment 42 ensures that not just health service providers, but all care service providers, for example, housing support services, are taken into account. I think I'll call Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to the Scottish Government for meeting with me after Stage 2 to clarify these points and just to signal the support of these benches to these amendments. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary if she wishes to wind up. Uh, nothing further. Thank you. Thank you very much. In that case, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 42 in the, in the name of Monica Lennon. Already debated. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's agreed. I call Amendments 2, 3 and 4, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, previously debated. Could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move on block? Moved on block. Thank you very much. 
Uh, does any member object to a single question being put on all three amendments? No one does. Therefore, the question is that amendments two to four are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So we turn now to group two, the commissioning of care services. Could I call amendment five in the name of the cabinet secretary grouped with amendments 43 and 44. Cabinet secretary to move amendment five and speak to all amendments in the group. Section 3.1 imposes a duty on care service providers to have regard to the guiding principles when carrying out the section, section 6 duty. Section 3.2 is then about the planning and commissioning aspect and when arrangements are being secured to get the care service delivered operationally by another person. The guiding principles already apply under Section 3.2a since commissioners already have to have regard to them under that uh, provision. Uh, this amendment clarifies that commissioners are also obliged to have regard to the fact that care service providers have to take those guiding principles into account as well. With this in mind, I would ask members uh, to support my amendment uh, to correct the existing uh, aspect of this bill, uh, which I believe uh, in this amendment provides clarity needed to assist those that we need to understand and implement the legislation. I'm also happy, uh, presiding officer, to indicate my support for David Stewart's amendments 44 and 43 and move my amendment 5. Thank you very much. And could I call David Stewart to speak to amendment 43, 45? 44 and the other amendment in the group. Yeah, uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'm speaking uh, to amendments 43 and 44. My name. Um, at stage one of the bill, the committee heard from groups uh, within the social care sector who were concerned that the bill placed all the focus on care providers and did not adequately recognise the impact that commissioning decisions about funding resources have on staffing levels. At stage two, I therefore lodge an amendment seeking to place a duty on commissioners of care to ensure that providers were given appropriate resources under contract. That would have required them to take into account uh, some of the factors that providers had to consider in setting staffing levels. Following some concerns from the government and local authorities, I agreed to further discussions on how the same principles could be agreed. The product of these discussions is Amendment 43 and the corresponding Amendment 44. Uh, amendment 43 would require local authorities and integra integration authorities to satisfy themselves prior to agreeing a contract for care that the contract or financial agreement will give adequate resources to providers to the provision of appropriate staffing levels. In doing so, they would have to consider for themselves the same factors that uh, care service providers are required to take into account under the duty placed on them by Section 6. Amendment 43 uh, also includes provision for local authorities and integration authorities when determining providers are to be given adequate resources, what the impact of entering the contract would be on the totality of the resources, namely any impact on resources available for other services. It's my understanding, President Officer, that the provisions would mean that no local authority or integration authority um, should enter a contract or financial arrangement for the provision of the care service where they believe that such an arrangement would leave them short of resources for the delivery of other services to which they are responsible. Uh, the draft of this amendment came from government. Um, before I move the amendment, I would therefore want to ask the Cabinet Secretary what she understands the effect of the amendment uh, uh, will be. And to ask the Cabinet Secretary if she wishes to add any remarks by way of conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, local authorities should consider both paragraphs A and B of subsection 2B when planning or securing the provision of a care service. Subsection 2B requires local authorities, when determining what constitutes adequate resources under subsection 2A, to have regard to the factors listed in section 62A to C and to have regard to the effect of securing the contract agreement or arrangements on the resources available for the provision of all other services, including care services, for which the local authority is responsible. This consideration would happen before finalising any contract, and this provision does not prohibit the local authority from entering a particular contract. Both parties will enter the contract, having agreed the terms and conditions of that contract. I think we've all recognised the complexity and difficulty of finding a suitable provision on this issue. Uh, should Mr Stewart, on reflection, believe that Amendment 43 does not offer the improvement uh, he was seeking, I will not object, should he wish to withdraw the amendment. 
In saying that, I wish to draw attention uh, to members that the Bill still provides that commissioners must have regard to the guiding principles and duties the Bill places on providers in their planning and commissioning of services. No, it looks like Mr Stewart would like to come back in. That's yeah. unusual, but yes, Mr yeah, Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, because I just thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Um, under the Bill as it currently stands, Commissioners must have regard to the duties on care providers, and I'm reluctant to see that undermined for that reason. Uh, with permission, President Officer, I'd like to withdraw both Amendments 43 and 44. Uh, thank you. The, the amendments have not been moved, so there's no need to withdraw them. However, the point is noted. Can I just encourage members that the, the way normally uh, groups would be managed is that the first amendment in the group, the spokesperson to the first person amendment in the group, gets a chance to speak. You then get one chance to speak after that on your amendments and all the amendments, and then the mover of the first amendment gets to conclude. So I'm afraid it's not possible to have interaction like that unless the Cabinet Secretary or somebody else was to press and ask for a request to speak. However, I'm flexible, so in this case it was fine. So I'm just explaining the rules to make sure you all know. Uh, now, so we're going to turn to... Yes, the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary to, uh, to press or withdraw her amendment. Uh, I'm okay. I wish to press, thank you. Thank you very much. I have officials to keep me straight in the rules as well, as is quite clear. <laughs> Uh, so the question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. It is agreed. And as we've already uh, agreed, David Stewart is not going to move 43. Is that right? right. Correct. Thank you. And Amendment 44 in the name to move or not move? That's not moved by Mr Stewart. We turn to Group 3, and this is the reporting on staffing by care services. Could I call Amendment 6 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings? If Amendment 6 is agreed to, I cannot call amendments 45 and 46 due to preemption. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 6 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I was pleased to have the support of all parties at Stage 2 for effective reporting on the progress of this staffing approach. Effective planning of staffing will feed into and support workforce planning at local and national level. I particularly welcome Ms Lennon's focus on ensuring transparency around the challenges faced when carrying out the duties in this bill. So Amendment 39 inserts a new section into Part 3 of the bill, placing a duty on ministers to publish an annual report on staffing levels in care services, in particular on the numbers of specific health professionals working in such services. I'm pleased to support amendments 45, 46, 39A, 39C and 39D in Ms Lennon's name and 39B in Ms Johnson's name. I note that Ms Lennon's amendment 46 would remove subsection 7 to 9 of section 3 and on that basis I am content that the reporting duty on local and integration authorities in subsection 6 of section 3 remains in the bill and when we have concluded this section, presiding officer, I will not press Amendment 6 in my name. I have merely uh, moved this amendment in order that we can get into that debate. I think what I'll do is I'll ask the Cabinet Secretary to uh, withdraw it later, but having moved it, I now call Monica Lennon uh, to speak to Amendment 45 and the other amendments in this group. Okay, and just keep me right, presiding officer. <laughs> um, at stage two, I brought forward amendments with the aim of establishing reporting requirements on local authorities in relation to the duties this bill places on them as commissioners of care. These amendments were intended to aid scrutiny of the new duties the bill created regarding staffing levels. The Cabinet Secretary's amendment today moved reporting duties on care service staffing levels into part three of the bill. I welcome Am Amendment 39 and the clarity it gives and where information on care service staffing levels may be found. However, I remain of the opinion that some reporting should be required of local authorities and integration authorities as the bill still places on them specific duties. Um, I was therefore going to ask members um, not to support Amendment 6 in the Cabinet Secretary's name and instead consider my amendments 45 and 46. Amendment 46 clarifies local authorities need only make information on how they have complied with their duties publicly available. This recognises that local authorities are accountable to their local electorates. Amendment 45 removes the reporting duties on ministers covered by the Cabinet Secretary's amendment, as well as removing detailed outcomes from reports, as this may not always be possible through commissioning structures. 
In addition, in this group, I have a number of amendments aimed to strengthen Amendment 39. Amendment 39A and 39D ensure that the discharge of staff training requirements on providers under Section 7 are also included in Scottish Minister's reports. This is important as future staffing tools mandated for use by the Scottish Ministers are likely to come with additional training requirements and the implementation of these should be captured within staffing reports. Finally, at stage two, the Cabinet Secretary made clear that given current commissioning structures, Scottish Ministers do not directly contract with care providers and cannot therefore directly provide private providers with certain funding. Despite this unsatisfactory position at stage two, the Cabinet Secretary also stated that the Scottish Government does have policy approaches that come with financial commitments, such as a living wage. In some instances, it is a matter between the Scottish Government and those in receipt of funding, uh, such as local authorities, as to whether the money is correctly passed on. Amendment 39C therefore requires ministers' reports to include information on the steps they have taken to ensure such money is passed on and providers have access to funding to assist in the discharge of their duties under the bill. Um, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for her comments and her clarity, her clarity around um, Amendment um, 6. Yes, <laughs> 6. And uh, this is not, it's not straightforward, Presiding Officer, um, but I will be moving the amendments in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Alison Johnson to speak to Amendment 39B and the other amendments in this group. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 39B would require Scottish ministers to set out how the information contained with within its annual reporting on care services will inform future workforce planning. At stage two, I lodged an amendment which aimed to ensure that the government considered all relevant information available to it when it commissioned training places for those who worked in the care sector. We know that care homes now care for people with more complex illnesses than previously, including those who require palliative care, and that there's a need for specialist input on aspects of care, such as nutrition and hydration. So my original amendment sought to ensure that we gave the same consideration to the care sector, which is clearly facing significant challenges, and particularly at this time of integration and the focus on integration, as we're giving to ensuring that there are appropriate staff in the NHS. Now, I didn't press that amendment at stage two due to members' concerns that it was too prescriptive. However, it is absolutely essential, I know we all agree, that we have appropriate and safe staffing levels in the care sector. Um, importantly, Amendment 39B will ensure that Scottish ministers take account of the reporting established by Amendment 39 on staffing and care services when determining the future supply of registered nurses and other health and care professionals. In closing, I'll be voting for Amendments 45 and 46 in the name of Monica Lennon as I agree that local and integration authorities publishing the proposed information is still a worthwhile and useful endeavour. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, uh, having moved Amendment 6 uh, to allow debate on this group, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary to wind up and also to see whether she's pressing or withdrawing Amendment 6? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm not pressing. Thank you very much. Uh, the Member wishes to withdraw Amendment 6. Is that agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 45 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated. Monica Lennon to move or not moved. move? That is moved. The question is that Amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We're going to turn now to Group 4, which is the duty on health boards and care services to ensure appropriate staffing and staff well-being. Can I call Amendment 7 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, grouped with Amendments 8, 9, 37, and 38? Alex Cole Hamilton, move Amendment 7 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It gives me pleasure to move the amendments in my name in this group and speak in support of all other amendments. Um, I was gratified at stage two when members on the Health Committee uh, passed amendments in my name, which expanded the scope of this bill, the definition, definitions of safety that we use in this bill. Not unsurprisingly, when this bill was first drafted, it was uh, done so with the safety of patients in mind. That should be the first starting point for any such legislation. But during the stage one evidence, I, we were told a story which was very compelling about uh, a situation on a mental health ward when uh, the RCN phoned the duty charge nurse at, uh, on duty that night and asked if they were 
safely staffed. And they said we were safe for the patients, but we weren't safe for us. The point is that they operated on an attack response basis and they had insufficient staffing that night to protect each other should something have uh, occurred. So it was that I, uh, with the help of RCN, drafted amendments to increase the, uh, the consideration of the safety of staff in this bill and amendments were passed at stage two. Um, I was grateful to the government for bringing to my attention there were potential problems here with the devolution settlement in that the original amendments passed at stage two strayed into health and safety at work legislation which is of course reserved and uh, working with the government we've constructed amendments seven and nine in my name which retain absolutely the meaning of those original stage two amendments but recognize the uh, nuances of the devolution settlement and I also also would like to offer the support of the Liberal Democrats to all other amendments in this group. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm calling the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 8 and the other amendment in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me start by thanking Mr Cole Hamilton for taking the time to speak to me about the amendments he inserted at Stage 2. We share the view that the well-being of staff is of paramount importance and I welcome his amendments of 7, 9 and 37. My own amendments 8 and 38 are intended to remove the words and services from the general duties for health and for care services. These words were inserted at stage 2, but they are unnecessary as health care is already defined in section 12 IG as a service or in connection with the prevention, diagnosis or treatment of illness. And care service is already defined in section 9 as a service mentioned in section 47.1 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010. These words therefore create unnecessary duplication and I'd ask members to support uh, the amendments in my name and move amendments 8 and 38. Thank you very much. And no other member has asked to speak. The question therefore, uh, so does Alex Cole Hamilton wish to wind up and to press or withdraw? Nothing further to add, move, I'll press, sorry. Thank you very much. The question therefore is that amendment seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Could I uh, call Amendment 8, already debated and I think already moved by the Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet, uh, does the Chamber, sorry, the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 9 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we turn now to Group 5, which is the duty on health boards to ensure appropriate staffing agency workers. I call Amendment 47 in the name of Anas Sarwar in a group on its own. Anas Sarwar to speak to and move Amendment 47. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I move the amendment in my name. What this amendment seeks to do is uh, pretty clear in terms of the words. It's to ensure value for money uh, in terms of for our health boards and NHS Scotland more widely. Uh, we have seen experiences where we are paying whole time equivalent four times as much for agency staff as we are for NHS staff. Uh, and what this bill would do or amendment would do, we would do at least set a principle of that cap should not go above 150% of what a whole time equivalent NHS salary uh, would be. Uh, this still leaves protections for when emergency situations are required, when health boards would have to employ people uh, on agencies above this rate, but it does insert uh, responsibility to publish the reasons why that has happened, the number of occasions that has happened uh, and what the trends behind it are. It also includes ministerial responsibility uh, to update uh, why those situations have occurred. We've had very positive interaction with the government over the course of uh, first tabling this amendment at stage two when I did not push it at committee stage uh, so we can have further interaction with the cabinet secretary. Uh, I'm pleased with how that interaction has gone. And I hope, given that we have accepted all of the government's uh, suggested amendments to our amendment, that the Cabinet Secretary will support it today. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. And I'm grateful to uh, Mr Sawar for working with me and my team on this amendment following stage two. My, my belief remains that the bill as amended will drive the necessary changes in the way in which staffing decisions are made to reduce the use of agency staff. In developing and scrutinising this legislation, both the government and opposition members have considered the whole system approach to staffing decisions. By this, I mean we have looked beyond the evidence-based staffing tools and methodologies and considered how decisions are taken at every level of the organisation. There has also been a focus on how these decisions are fed back to the staff uh, who have informed them. 
This is why I, Miles Briggs, David Stewart and others have put a significant amount of effort into working with our stakeholders to finalise the provisions on real-time assessment of staffing, escalation processes and appropriate clinical advice. It is this system of effective and informed governance that will drive the changes we all wish to see. By ensuring that staffing decisions are, taking, are taken based on workload and taking into account appropriate clinical evidence, we will move towards the appointment of a sustainable staffing establishment. It will also ensure that if agency staff are used, it is part of an appropriate risk mitigation approach. But I can absolutely appreciate the intention behind Mr Sarwar's amendment, and I thank him again for taking the time to discuss it further with me. Uh, I do think there are some difficulties with the drafting of this amendment uh, and the requirements on boards could be considered to be ambiguous, but I believe that these can be clarified in the statutory guidance that will accompany the bill. And in this instance, it is my view that the value of the intention outweighs these points, and I am therefore happy to support this amendment. Thank you. And no other member has asked to speak. I therefore ask Anasawa to wind up and to press or withdraw this amendment. Uh, just to say, I, I welcome all the content of the Cabinet Secretary's response. I think we both have the exact same intention, uh, and therefore I welcome her support for the amendment. I'm happy to move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn to Group 6, Staffing Assessment and Risk Escalation by Health Boards. Could I call Amendment 10? In the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 10 and to speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome all of the amendments lodged by Mr Briggs and Mr Stewart in this group, and I want to thank them for their collaborative work on these provisions in particular. I'd also like to thank the members of the Escalation Working Group who have put a significant amount of effort into ensuring these provisions work for all staff groups and across our healthcare system. My own amendments are fairly technical in nature. Amendment 10 inserts the word safe into the subsection 12IAA2A2 so that it is consistent with the wording in the general duty for health following the, the addition of this wording by Mr Cole Hamilton at stage two. Uh, Amendment 11 inserts reference to the new paragraph added through David Stewart's Amendment 59 into the list of those staff members who must be notified of every decision made in relation to risk so that all those who have been involved in attempting to reach a decision on the mitigation of a risk under this section should be notified of the final decision reached and should have the opportunity to record disagreement with that decision if they wish. Similarly, Amendment 12 inserts reference to new subsection into uh, section 12 IAB 2 D 4 so that those who have provided clinical advice in any part of the procedures put in place under this section should be notified of the decision reached and again should have the opportunity to record disagreement with that decision if they wish. Amendment 20 amends section 12 IE reporting on staffing to include reference to 12 IABA the duty to have arrangements to address severe and recurrent risks being inserted by David Stewart's Amendment 62. 12IAB, the duty to seek clinical advice on staffing being inserted by Mr Briggs' Amendment 63. 12IAD, the duty in to ensure adequate time given to clinical leaders being inserted by my own Amendment 18. And 12IAE, the duty to ensure appropriate staffing, training of staff, which was inserted at stage two by Ms Johnson. This will ensure that health boards and the agency must include information on their compliance with these duties in the reports that they are to provide to ministers on an annual basis. Finally, Amendment 23 sets out that ministers can issue guidance under Section 12 IF on the new duty to have arrangements to address severe and recurrent risks imposed by the new Section 12 IABA. All that said, Presiding Officer, I move at Amendment 10 and the others in my name. Thank you very much. And I call David Stewart to speak to Amendment 48 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And could I start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for the very helpful meetings that we had about planning 
the, this amendment to ensure that we've got a stronger uh, bill. Uh, Beside officer, the Royal College of Nursing, and I welcome them to the gallery today, have made it clear from the start of the bill that it will only be effective if it deals with how to manage day-to-day -day staffing levels, not just with setting expected staffing establishments. For that reason, I was glad to see the introduction of provision for risk management and escalation by the government at stage two. Uh, many of my amendments, namely 48 to 51 and 50 through 53 through to 60, make only minor changes to the successful uh, provisions from stage two. The purpose of these amendments are purely technical in strengthening the risk assessment and escalation processes that have been established. To that end, President Officer, I will speak to them group by purpose rather than chronological order. Uh, Amendment 48 ensures that any risk assessment procedure includes a method by which staff members may notify responsible individuals of the possible risk, closing a potential gap in procedures as they currently exist. Amendments um, 49, 53 and 54 um, alter the precise definition of the individuals and management structures involved in the process so that non-clinical managers uh, who make and who bear responsibility for staffing levels can be included within the procedure. That being said, the role of clinical experience and advice in staffing decisions cannot be overlooked. Uh, it is therefore protected by Amendment 55 and 57. Uh, which then put a requirement on decision-making individuals within the structure to seek and have regard to clinical advice. Amendments 56 and 58 empower the individuals involved to take decisions on how to actually mitigate any risk which is identified and escalated. Uh, Amendment uh, 59 then allows for the escalation of any risk up to the management chain as necessary, potentially up to board level itself. Amendment 60 ensures there is an opportunity and process by which individuals may request review of a decision on risk should they be concerned or dissatisfied by the final outcome. Um, obviously, risk assessment and notification procedures are only of use if staff are aware of them and that they can be utilised. For that reason, Amendment 51 requires health boards to proactively encourage and enable staff to make use of the procedures. In the same vein, I can confirm that we are supportive of Amendment 52 and 61, uh, lodged by Miles Briggs, um, which similarly ensures that staff are equipped to use the procedure. Uh, finally, President Officer, Amendment 62 in my name seeks not uh, to alter but to add to provisions that are already in place. Uh, as much as real-time risk assessment and escalation are important, it is crucial that they are not used purely for an on-ground firefighting. Um, health boards and those who scrutinise them should be able to have an overview of the risks in their staffing levels, especially if these risks are substantial and are likely to reoccur. When we have long-standing vacancies across a number of key posts in our health services, day-to-day uh, -day assessment and mitigation uh, will not be satisfactory or sufficient. Amendment 62 therefore establishes a requirement for health boards to keep a record of the most significant and potentially reoccurring risks, as well as put in place a plan for how they will be managed. The majority of health boards already have such a similar process in place for risk for staffing. The amendment really makes the requirement clear and should provide a mechanism for linking the situation staff have to deal with on the ground to higher level monitoring and planning. So, President Officer, I move amendments 48 to 51 and 53 to 60 and 62, all in my name. Thank you very much. And I call Miles Briggs to speak to Amendment 52 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I move the amendments in my name. Um, amendment 52 relates back to my Stage 2 Amendment 105. However, unlike that amendment, it takes account of the fact that only those individuals with lead professional responsibility will be responsible for carrying out these staffing assessment procedures. And so it sets out that these individuals are to be given the training and resources necessary to carry out these procedures. Similarly, Amendment 61 sets out that individuals with lead professional responsibility and other senior uh, decision makers are to be given the training time and resources necessary as well to carry out the risk escalation procedures detailed in section 12IAB and I ask members to support both amendments in my name. Thank you very much and if there's no one else wishes to speak could I call on the cabinet secretary to wind up and uh, to press or withdraw her own amendment. Nothing further presiding officer and I will press. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 48, already moved by David Stewart. The question is that Amendment 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 49 in the name of David Stewart, already debated. Uh, I think already moved as well. The question is that Amendment 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
we are agreed. I call Amendment 50 in the name of David Stewart, already debated, uh, already moved. The question is that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 51 in the name of David Stewart, already debated and moved. The question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 52 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 53 in the name of David Stewart. David Stewart to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 54 in the name of David Stewart. David Stewart to move or not move? Side enough, sir. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 55 in the name of David Stewart. David Stewart to move or not move? Uh, move, President Officer. sir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 56 in the name of David Stewart. David Stewart to move or not move? Move, President Officer. sir. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 57, 58 and 59 in the name of David Stewart. David Stewart to move or not move? Move, President Officer. That is moved. Uh, I put the question, Amendments 57, 58 59 on block. Does anyone object? No one objects. Amendments 57, 58 59 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 12, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 60, in the name of David Stewart. David Stewart, to move or not move? Uh, move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 61, in the name of Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs, to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 62 in the name of David Stewart. Already debated. David Stewart to move or not move? Mm. Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 7, Clinical Role and Advice in Health Board Governance. Can I call Amendment 63 in the name of Miles Briggs, grouped with Amendments 18, 18A and 18B, Miles Briggs to move Amendment 63 and to speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This amendment is an alternative, an alternative to the Amendment 123, which I lodged and then withdrew at Stage 2 on the role of the designated person. I've now had a number of discussions with the Cabinet Secretary to agree an alternative approach to ensure the bill captures the crucial role to clinical advice in relation to decisions made by the Board on the various duties placed on them by this bill. Amendment 63, rather than designating a person, places health boards under a duty to put arrangements in place to ensure that clinical advice is sought in relation to staffing decisions and any arrangements they put in place in relation to staffing, such as the development of a risk escalation process under Section 12 IAB, and that they have uh, this in regard to the, any advice. Where a board makes a staffing decision that goes against clinical advice, this must be noted and those who provide advice informed. Boards must also identify any risk which may arise as a result of this decision and take appropriate action to mitigate them. There is also provision for an internal reporting procedure, which is an important element in relation to both board transparency and accountability. Senior clinical professionals would report to the members of the board at least quarterly on the extent to which, in their view, the board is complying with the duties placed on them by this bill. The inclusion of at least will allow them to submit reports to the board at any time if they feel that the board is not meeting the duties placed on them by the bill. I therefore ask members uh, to support this alternative approach and I move Amendment 63. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 18 and other amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I start again by uh, expressing my gratitude to Mr Briggs for working with me following the Stage 2 Proceedings Amendment 63, as he says, seeks to amend the bill by placing health boards under a duty to put arrangements in place to ensure that clinical advice is sought from senior clinical professionals by health boards and that they must have regard to this advice in reaching any decision on staffing. 
I agree with Mr Briggs on the importance of ensuring the professional voice is heard, and this is already woven throughout the Bill. However, I believe Amendment 63 strengthens this and is the appropriate way to ensure health boards must seek that professional advice while ensuring that the accountability for decisions remains with the board. And I'm therefore happy to support Amendment 63. Amendment 18 in my name removes and replaces Section 12 IAD. I fully recognise the unique role of the senior charge nurse and agree it is important that this is protected, but I do not believe that the existing wording of Section 12 IAD, which does not take account of the multidisciplinary teams or allow for flexibility regarding the size of the team and the service delivery model, is the best way to achieve this. It is not always appropriate to require health boards to make all senior charge nurses 100% non-caseload holding. One example of many uh, would be on the Shetland Isles, where there are a number of community nursing teams spread over the islands, which have between two and eight staff in each. There are currently two senior ch charge nurses providing clinical leadership across all of these teams. As currently drafted, Section 12 IAD would not allow for this model and re would require a senior nurse in each team to be 100% non-caseload holding and for each of these nurses to be backfilled. This is not sustainable and would not allow health boards to develop models of care which suit their local needs and their patients. Because the definition of caseload holding is tied to the wide requir requirement to meet patient needs and not to the more specific requirement to provide direct patient care, I do not believe it delivers the intention of ensuring senior charge nurses have protected time to fulfil their clinical leadership role. And imagine it would be very difficult for boards to identify senior nurses who were not required to meet patient needs. I'm also aware of concerns among stakeholders that a requirement for a fully non-caseload -case holding senior nurse in every rostered location could have the unintended consequence of diverting resources away from other clinical team leaders. For these reasons, I believe it is essential that we replace the existing Section 12 IAD with a provision that works in all clinical settings. I have therefore worked with Ms Johnson and stakeholders uh, from a number of professional groups to develop an amendment which applies not just to senior charge nurses, but to whomever the appropriate clinical team leader is for a team of staff, be that a midwife, allied health professional, nurse or doctor. Amendment 18 recognises the unique roles and responsibilities of all clinical team leaders and ensures that they receive adequate time to discharge that responsibility and their other professional duties. This provides flexibility for the appropriate amount of time to be allocated depending on the local context, the size and nature of the team and healthcare setting. And I ask members to support Amendment 18. I'm content with Ms Johnson's amendments to my Amendment 18 and I welcome her support for it. Thank you, and I call Alison Johnson to speak to Amendment 18A and the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendments 18A and 18B have come about as a result of discussion with, with the Royal College of Nursing, with allied health professionals, the Royal College of Midwives, and, of course, the Government. Um, at Stage 2, as you've heard, I was successful in amending the Bill to ensure that senior charge nurses had the time that they need to carry out their important clinical leadership roles. The results of a freedom of information request to NHS boards from the Royal College of Nursing show that of the 911 whole-time equivalent senior charge nurses identified in September 2017, only 115 were non-caseload holding. I have listened to what the Cabinet Secretary has said and I am sure that, that she will agree too that there are many occasions when it is entirely appropriate for senior charge nurses to be non-case load holding, and we must make sure that that is the case where it is appropriate. Um, I am pleased that we've now reached a proposal that all healthcare professionals are content with, but I was pleased to push my earlier amendment at stage two because nurses do make up 42% of the NHS workforce. But my amendments um, now have been welcomed by nurses, by midwives, by allied health professionals, as we have heard. And they seek to make absolutely sure 
that all lead professionals have the sufficient time and the resources they require to carry out that role and that their leadership role is fully recognised. Amendment 18A seeks to amend Amendment 18. It would ensure that clinical leaders have the resources they, requ they require as well as the time to satisfactorily discharge their leadership responsibilities. And Amendment 18B similarly seeks to amend Amendment 18 and would clarify that clinical leaders need sufficient time to lead the delivery of healthcare, as arguably all healthcare professionals and staff contribute to its delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. And no other member wishes to speak or has asked to speak. Can I call on Miles Briggs to wind up in this group and to press or withdraw Amendment 63? Um, I'd like to press both amendments. Thanks. Thank you very much. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We're going to turn now to Group 8, which is the duty on health boards to ensure appropriate staffing, numbers and training of healthcare professionals. Could I call Amendment 13 in the name of Alison Johnson, grouped with Amendments 15, 17 and 19. Alison Johnson to move Amendment 13 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Um, section 12 IAC ensures that enough student places are offered to train a workforce that will better ensure we deliver the health care that will meet Scotland's changing needs. Amendment 13 acknowledges that there are factors out with Minister's control, but still requires Ministers to take all reasonable steps to ensure that there are sufficient numbers of registered health care professionals. Amendment 15 adds a stipulation that Scottish Ministers must take into account variation in staffing needs caused by differences in geographical areas. The healthcare needs of rural populations often differ greatly from those of more urban communities. Our rural and island boards face particular challenges around recruitment and retention. And this amendment will ensure that Scottish ministers have regard to rural specific issues in their determinations. Amendment 17 clarifies what is expected of Scottish ministers in reporting to Parliament on these provisions, in setting out the extent to which Minister's compliance with the duty on supply in Section 12 IEC has enabled health boards to comply with their own duty to ensure appropriate staffing under Section 12 IE. And Section 12 IEE places a duty on NHS boards to ensure that employees receive the time to carry out continuing professional development. NHS governance standards already state that employers will give time to staff for CPD, but as we're all too well aware, that time is often lost because of the demands on staff and their time. So Amendment 19 would ensure that employees will receive sufficient time and resources to undertake training, but will allow health boards to take a reasonable approach to determining what is appropriate training and resourcing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, no one has asked to speak in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome the amendments from Ms Johnson. I'm grateful to her that we were able to work on them. Uh, in particular, I'm pleased uh, with the recognition of an, the open-ended nature of Section 12 IAE, which was inserted uh, as a, by her amendment uh, at Stage 2. But her, now her Amendment 13 will ensure that health boards must ensure appropriate time for training, subject to ensuring continuity of staff and high quality services. And I offer my support to the amendments in her name. Thank you very much. So, Alison Johnson to wind up in this group and to press or withdraw Amendment 13. Um, I am content with the debate that we have had, uh, Presiding Officer, and I would like to move Amendment 13. Thank you very much. The question therefore is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We're going to turn now to Group 9, Application of Duties and Bills to Special Health Boards. Could I call Amendment 14 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with the other amendments as shown in the grouping, and the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 14 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Section 12 IAC, which places a duty on Scottish Ministers to ensure sufficient numbers of staff are available to every geographical health board and the Common Services Agency to enable them to comply with the general duty, was inserted at, section, uh, at Stage 2 by Ms Johnson. My amendments 14 and 16 ensure that this duty also applies to clinical facing special health boards, meaning the State Hospital Board for Scotland, the Scottish Ambulance Service, NHS 24 and the National Waiting Time Centre Board. 
Amendments 24 to 35 ensure that the new sections, <coughs> excuse me, which are being inserted through stage three amendments, uh, along with the section 12 IAE on the training of staff, also apply to those special health boards. Uh, and with that said, I move Amendment 14 and the others in my name. Thank you very much. And there are no other requests to speak, so we're going to go straight to the question. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, could I call Amendment 15 already in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Could I call Amendment 16 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 17 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. I now call Amendment 18A in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. That is moved. So the question is that Amendment 18A be agreed to or are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Could I call Amendment 18B in the name of Alison Johnson? Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 18B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 18 as amended. Press. Pressed. The question is that Amendment 18 as amended be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 19 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 10. The duty to follow common staffing method for health care. Could I call Amendment 64 in the name of Miles Briggs, grouped with Amendments 65 to 69, 21 and 22. Miles Briggs to move Amendment 64 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Having met further with the Cabinet Secretary to discuss amendments placed in the bill during Stage 2, um, I, her skills of persuasion has persuaded me uh, that some further amendment is required in Section uh, 12 IB to make it clear that setting the staffing establishment is not the only purpose of the common staffing method and to avoid any duplication which might cause confusion amongst those responsible for carrying out the method. I was clear at Stage 2 that it was never my intention to prevent the common staffing method being used for other purposes such as supporting the redesign of services. With that in mind, Amendment 64, 68 and 69 removed subsections 12 IB, 1A and 1B, which were placed in the bill as an amendment of mine at stage two, and instead alter the subsection 12 IB, 2D to state that having followed the steps in the common staffing, staffing method, the Health Board is to decide what changes, if any, are needed as a result of its staffing establishment and to the way in which it provides health care. A definition of the term staffing establishment is then provided. Amendment 65 clarifies that the measures for monitoring and improving the quality of health care which are published as standards and outcomes under, under section 10H1 by the Scottish Ministers and which are to be taken account of as part of the common staffing method include any measures developed as part of the National Care Assurance Framework. Amendment 67 makes a minor change to the common staffing method. In, at stage two, I lodged an amendment passed by committee, which added a new step in the common staffing method, requiring health boards to take account of experience of using uh, the real-time assessment and risk escalation processes in section 12IAA and 12IAB. It seems to me that the new linked duty to have arrangements in place to address severe and recurrent risks put forward by David Stewart in his Amendment 62, uh, which we have already debated today, should also be included in this step in, common staffing, in the common staffing method. Amendment 67 therefore adds into this, this step uh, as a reference in section 12 IABA. I therefore ask members to support all my amendments and I move men, Amendment uh, 64. Thank you very much. And I call David Stewart to speak to Amendment 66 and the other amendments in this group. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, in this group, I have only one minor amendment. Uh, at stage two, there were a number of additions and alterations to the bill in order to make explicit and protect its multidisciplinary nature. 
staff groups of which there is not yet a staffing tool had expressed concern that use of the existing tools might draw resources away from other staff groups, an unintended consequence uh, of not yet having multidisciplinary tools in place. At stage two, I therefore brought forward an amendment which would require the impact on other staff groups be taken into account using the common staffing method in establishment uh, staffing levels. Amendment 66 in my name today seeks only to alter the wording of the addition. The language of the bill refers to tools that should be used for different types of healthcare rather than different types of professions. Amendment 66 therefore changes the wording of my stage two addition to reflect this. The original purpose remains the same, namely the delivery services of which a staffing tool does not yet exist uh, should be overlooked or understaffed by appropriate professionals so that uh, statutory standards uh, can be met elsewhere. President officer, I move the amendment 66 in my name. Thank you very much. And I call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 21 and the other amendment in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by saying I'm pleased to offer my full support to Mr Briggs' Amendments 64, 68 and 69. Amendment 22 is consequential uh, to Mr Briggs' Amendment 68 in that it amends the word staffing levels in Section 12 IF, Ministerial Guidance on Staffing, to Staffing Establishment uh, for the purposes of consistency. Amendment 21 is a technical amendment to clarify that guidance may cover a step in the common staffing method that was inserted at stage two. I support Mr Briggs' Amendment 65 and 67 and Mr Stewart's Amendment 66, which provide helpful clarifications to the common staffing method set out in 12IB and uh, move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And again, no one has asked to speak. So Miles Briggs to wind up in this group and to press or withdraw Amendment 64. Um, nothing further to add, uh, presiding officer, and I move uh, Amendment 64. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 65 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Call Amendment 66 in the name of David Stewart, already debated. David Stewart, to move or not move? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 67 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated. Miles Briggs, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 67 in the name of Miles Briggs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 68 in the name of Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs, to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 69 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Formally moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendments 20 to 35, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Could I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 20 to 35 on block? Moved on block. Thank you very much. Does any member object if a single question be put on Amendments 20 to 35? No. no, that's good. The question therefore is that Amendments 20 to 35 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we turn now to Group 11, the role of Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And I call Amendment 36 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 70, Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 36 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, my Amendment 36 is a technical amendment which adds to the list at Section 12 IH, which is a list of duties which Healthcare Improvement Scotland must monitor the discharge of by every health board, relevant special health board and common services agency. This ensures that his will have oversight of the discharge of every aspect of this legislation by health boards. Having worked with Mr Briggs ahead of today, I'm also happy to support Amendment 70 in his name and move Amendment 36. Thank you very much. And I call on Miles Briggs to speak to Amendment 70 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I have, since Stage 2, had helpful discussions with the Cabinet Secretary around how staffing tools in the Health Service will be reviewed and developed by Healthcare Improvement Scotland and what evidence and guidance they will take into account whilst doing so. 
Um, I therefore hope that my Amendment 70 reflects this and ensures that the, the development of staffing tools and methods continues to be based on the best available professional guidance and clinical evidence. I therefore, on that basis, ask members to support it today. Thank you very much. No one else wishes to speak in this group. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to add any comments to wind up? Nothing further, thank you. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 70 in the name of Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated. Alex Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 38 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move formally. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 12, Care Services, Employment Rights of Staff, and I call Amendment 71 in the name of Monica Lennon, grouped with Amendments 72 to 78. Monica Lennon to move Amendment 71 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In February this year, the Fair Work Convention's report into Fair Work in Scotland's social care sector found that the social care sector was not consistently delivering fair work and that its ability to do so was hindered by the current funding and commissioning structures. We know that the bill, as it stands, will not produce the additional caring staff that Scotland needs. But Scottish Labour believes that improving conditions within the sector would be a key step to addressing the social care challenges Scotland currently faces. Presiding officer, section seven of this bill requires care providers to provide their staff with appropriate training for their jobs and suitable assistance in completing that training. These provisions are an encouraging recognition of the need to better support care service workers. The guiding principles of staffing found in section one of the bill contain the provision that staffing should be arranged to ensure the well-being of staff. Amendment 71 to 78 in my name would add to these provisions along the principles of fair work. There is no definition of well-being within the bill, but I would argue that my amendments go some way toward defining the standards that well-being requires. The amendments would see care service workers properly reimbursed for costs incurred through the course of their work, be they uniform and clothing costs, travel costs for journeys between service visits, fees for necessary professional registrations, or the cost of any training workers must undergo. It is not acceptable that staff are still required to pay out of their own pocket for such items. Amendment 75 would place on a statutory footing the Scottish Government's current policy commitment for care service workers to be paid a living wage. Amendment 77 provides a definition for such a living wage using language lifted straight out of the Scottish Government's own Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2006. Amendment 76 and the consequential amendment 78 would ensure that care service workers are given contracts with clearly defined hours giving them the security that a zero-hour contract can never offer. Presiding officer, this bill acknowledges that staffing is central to the delivery of safe and high-quality health and care services. These amendments are in line with that principle. The social care that service users want and need cannot be delivered by staff that are overworked, stressed, struggling to get by and at risk of burnout. And I know the Cabinet Secretary understands and agrees with that sentiment. I believe my amendments would give Scottish workers and care services a guarantee of fair work. Since lodging the amendments last week, a number of organisations have expressed to me and colleagues that they think such standards should definitely be in place. However, um, I have appreciated the opportunity to discuss uh, with the Cabinet Secretary and her officials these amendments, and I have taken on board um, the concerns that they have raised that some of these amendments uh, fall outside the legislative competence of this Parliament. But in our discussions, the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed that she's supportive of the principle these amendments aim to achieve, and I know that many others in this chamber uh, also um, concur with that. Presiding officer, I'm not clear as to how my amendments was, would substantially differ from the apparent workers' rights within Section 1 and Section 7 provisions. However, I acknowledge the Scottish Government's concern and um, I wouldn't want this debate to become about one legal opinion against another because there is so much in this bill that we can and have already supported. 
As an alternative, the Cabinet Secretary has indicated to me that she will ensure guidance accompanying the bill will make clear that these standards of fair work are to be followed in the delivery of care services. If the Cabinet Secretary is willing to make a clear uh, commitment to the Chamber today that these standards of fair work for social care um, and commit to guidance um, alongside the bill um, to, to follow these fair work practices in care commissioning and delivery, then I will be content not to move these amendments. Um, I, was, I wasn't sure if the Cabinet Secretary was going to come in at that point there. So, um, at the moment, um, if, if I have that commitment, I'm hoping I have, I, I won't press the, the... Can I suggest to Monica Lennon that she move the amendment and then if the Cabinet Secretary in the response agrees, then yes. you can uh, withdraw the yes. amendment? Happy to do so. On that basis, then, I move the amendments in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And could I call Alex Cole Hamilton? Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, colleagues will be... Uh, remember the c case of my constituent George Ballantyne who spent 150 nights in the Liberton Hospital after he was declared fit to go home. That was due in part to a deficiency in availability of social care provision in Edinburgh. There is a crisis in social care in this nation's capital and as such I am compelled by Monica Lennon's arguments. I think that we need to do more to recognise fair work in the social care sector. We need to uh, make it an attractive profession for people to choose from the early days of primary school and direct their careers forthwith. And I think unless we start to make changes like this, then we will uh, reap the whirlwind in terms of that crisis in our social care sector. So happy to support Monica's, uh, Lennon's amendments. Uh, obviously, if she doesn't move them, then I too would like to see the commitment from the Cabinet Secretary to see this addressed and guidance behind the bill. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And let me begin by welcoming the intention behind these amendments from uh, Ms Lennon. As a government, we've done what we can within the powers of this parliament to encourage every organisation, regardless of size, sector or location, to ensure all staff receive a fair level of pay and, where possible, pay the real living wage. We are committed to fair work, payment of the real living wage, and becoming accredited can make a real difference to the lives of people working in Scotland. It benefits the economy and sends a positive signal to the wider community, and I completely accept it is also an important factor in the recruitment and retention of staff in this very important sector. We have and continue to condemn the use of exploitative business practice and as members are aware our Fair Work Action Plan developed with the STUC was published in February of this year. However, for as long as employment law remains reserved to the UK Parliament, we are restricted in the next steps that many of us in this chamber would want to take. What that means is that the amendments from Ms Lennon are strictly out with the competence of this Parliament uh, and nonetheless, though, we have demonstrated that regardless of that barrier, we will push for changes. I'm grateful to Ms Lennon, uh, not only for bringing these amendments, but for indicating uh, her intention not to press them, provided the assurance that I can give her is satisfactory, because I believe that if these amendments were passed, it would be inevitable that the entire piece of legislation would be referred to the UK Supreme Court because we have strayed into reserved areas. And I know that there is no one in this chamber who absolutely supports uh, what this uh, legislation is intended to achieve for our staff in health and social care who would wish that to happen. So I am content, more than content, to offer Ms Lennon the assurance that the principles, uh, the fair work principles that are set out in her amendments uh, will be included in the guidance that supports this implementation of the legislation, that I will be returning to the Health Committee with that draft guidance to ensure that they have the opportunity be, to be consulted upon uh, as with other matters in relation to uh, the guidance. I hope that assurance uh, is enough for Ms Lennon and I would urge her not to press her amendments, uh, but to work with me once we come to constructing the guidance. Thank you very much. And there are no other members who wish to speak, so Monica Lennon to wind up in this group and to press or withdraw Amendment 71. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I just begin by thanking Alex Cole Hamilton and the Scottish Liberal Democrats for, for, for their support on this matter. And I think indeed across the, the Chamber there's been support. Um, building on the constructive talks that I've had with the Cabinet Secretary and the remarks that she just made, um, I strongly welcome her strong commitment and strong assurance. And I look forward to the guidance coming before the Health and Support Committee. And I'm sure colleagues there will do a very good job to make sure that the guidance fully takes on board the points that were made by the amendments. And I appreciate 
the Cabinet Secretary's uh, commitment on that. And I'm um, withdrawing the amendments in my Thank you very much. The question actually is that the Amendment 71 be withdrawn. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And can I just confirm uh, with Ms Lennon that she does not wish to move amendments 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77 and 78? Not moved. Not moved. And no other member wishes to move any of these amendments. Therefore, these amendments are not moved. I now call Amendment 38 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 6. Cabinet Secretary to move. Sorry, sorry, big one. Oh, it's 39, sorry. Can't even read. Could I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 6. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move formally. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 39. Oh, no, hang on a second. I call Amendment 39A in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 6. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. So the question is that Amendment 39A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 39B in the name of Alison Johnston, already debated. Alison Johnston to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 39B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 39C in the name of Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 39C be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Am Amendment 39D in the name of Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 39D be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So the Cabinet Secretary press or withdraw Amendment 39 as amended. The press. That's pressed. And the question is that Amendment 39, as amended, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 13, Staffing Methods for Care Services. Could I call Amendment 79 in the name of David Stewart, grouped with Amendments 80, 81, 82, 40 and 41, and David Stewart to speak, sorry, to move Amendment 40 and, sorry, Amendment 79, and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, th <coughs> thank you, President Officer. The amendments in this group all relate to the staffing tools that may be developed in the future uh, for the care sector. If I may touch uh, firstly and briefly on amendments uh, 80 to 82, which have been lodged by Miles Briggs, which seek to ensure that the development of such tools take into account professional and clinical guidance, as well as any accepted care indicators, seems to me to be both uh, sensible and appropriate. Uh, amendment 79 in my name seeks to establish some parity with health services and part two of the bill. Uh, as we've already discussed today in health services, it's crucial that risk to staffing levels can be identified, uh, appropriately escalated and mitigated. The same also applies to social care services. I recognise that the social care sector, unlike the health service, is made up of a range of providers who vary in size and the type of service they deliver. For this reason, it's not appropriate to set down in primary legislation precise procedures that all must uh, establish and follow with regard to staffing risks, as has been done in part two of the bill. Uh, the different staff and management structures across the care sector makes it unlikely uh, and it would be possible, uh, that it would be possible to craft a process, even in general terms, that would work for everyone. So Amendment 79 therefore includes the option for risk management guidance to be built into staffing tools that are developed for care services. Importantly, the wording of this amendment allows for flexibility in how such risk management procedures could be developed for differing care services. I move Amendment 79 in my name. Thank you. And Miles Briggs to speak to Amendment 80 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Amendment 80 relates back to um, my Amendment 122, which I withdrew at Stage 2. As is the case with staff, staffing methods in health, I believe it's crucial that the prof professional voice is at the core of staffing methods in care. In recognition of the diversity of staff groups providing care, Amendment 80 therefore sets out that a staffing method recommended for use by the care service providers may take account of recommendations of senior care sector or healthcare professionals with qualifications and experience that are appropriate to the care service in question. As staffing methods are developed, this will ensure that consideration is given to who is best placed to provide advice on staffing decisions based on the method, be it a nurse, a care worker or an allied health professional. Amendments 81 and 82 relate to amendments 117 and 120 lodged in my name at stage two. 
Given that not all care providers uh, provide clinical care, it would not be appropriate, for, uh, appropriate to have clinical quality indicators for all care services. It's important to remember that care setting is, off, is often uh, someone's home. Amendment 81 therefore sets out that any staffing method developed and recommended for use in care services may take into account such indicators or measures relating to the quality of care or as the care inspectorate considers appropriate. My Amendment 70 sets out that in developing new or revised staffing tools for health settings, Healthcare Improvement Scotland must have regard to relevant evidence and professional guidance. Amendment 82 creates a parallel provision on the care side so that the care inspectorate should also consider when developing new staff staffing methods for care services in collaboration with stakeholders whether appropriate evidence and professional guidance should be included in the method. I ask members to support my amendments in this group. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 40 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I want to thank both David Stewart and Miles Briggs for working with me following the Stage 2 proceedings to bring forward their alternative amendments. I am happy to support Amendment 79 in Mr Stewart's name and Amendments 80, 81 and 82 in the name of Miles Briggs. Amendment 40 uh, would have introduced a regulati regulation making power to allow ministers to amend the list in section 82A5 of what may be included in a staffing method for care services at the care inspectorate's discretion. Amendment 41 would have made that power subject to the affirmative procedure. It would not be appropriate to specify absolute requirements around the development of staffing tools and methodologies for the care sector. These have not yet been developed and I have consistently given commitments to the care sector that they will be developed by the sector for the sector. It should be uh, up to those involved in developing methods to determine the content. Amendment 40 was lodged to ensure that this flexibility was maintained. I'm pleased that following our discussions at stage two, members agree that this flexibility is important and have not sought to be overly prescriptive in what must be included in a staffing methodology for the care sector. As I've already let the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee know, I therefore intend not to move amendments 40 and 41 as they are no longer required. Thank you very much. And Dave Stewart, David Stewart, to uh, wind up in this group, and to press or withdraw Amendment 79. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I press uh, Amendment 79. I have nothing further to add. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 79 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Could I call Amendment 80 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated? Miles Briggs to move or not move? Move. That is moved. And the question is that Amendment 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 81 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 82 in the name of Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Formally move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now I call Amendment 40. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to confirm that she's not moving Amendment 40? Not moving. Not moved. And can I also confirm that Amendment 41, the Cabinet Secretary does not wish to move Amendment 41? Not moved. That is not moved. And that ends consideration of amendments. Now, at this stage, um, as members will be aware, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of this bill re relates relates to a protected subject matter, that is whether it affects the uh, franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, my view is that it does not. Therefore, it does not require a supermajority at stage three, which I know Mr Swinney is fascinated to hear. Um, members will also be delighted to hear that we have made very rapid progress through this bill. The chances are uh, we're going to consult with business managers and almost certainly going to move to bring forward decision time. However, I, I, can I suggest that we have a short suspension of five minutes and we resume here at uh, 15.48. Resume at 15.48, okay, 15.50, 15.50. Resume at 15.50 to, for the stage three debate. Short suspension, thank you.
May I call everyone to, to order, please? Thank you. And the next item of business is debate on motion 17127 in the name of Jean Freeman on stage three of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Jean Freeman to speak to and move the motion for seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This bill will put into legislation a system-wide approach to supporting and empowering staff across the health and care system to assess and respond to the workload associated with the delivery of high quality patient care. And I want to start this debate by thanking the organizations and members across this chamber who have so constructively contributed to the development and improvement of this important legislation. The Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill is grounded in and builds on the excellent approach to workload planning led by our nurses and midwives. And I was very fortunate this morning at Forth Valley to see how that approach works in terms of developing and improving both safe care, but also quality care. The development of the staffing methodology and speciality specific tools has been an innovative, evidence-based and importantly, a professionally led approach. Scotland has led the way in developing these tools and methodologies for nursing and midwifery. And now we can become world leading in enshrining this approach in legislation and by extending its core principles across our health and care system. Presiding officer, this legislation matters to our National Health Service and to our healthcare staff, but critically, it also matters to patients and those who receive social care. We see the crucial link between safe staffing, utilising the multiple skills of the multidisciplinary team to the quality and safety of the service received. It is a critical component of a safer healthcare system for the people of Scotland. At the recent International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare held in Glasgow, we welcomed leaders of healthcare systems from across the world. When we hear the head of healthcare improvement Denmark say, and I quote, I have been following Scotland for the last 10 years and have seen major changes and outstanding outcomes that we do not see anywhere else in the world at a system level. I think our healthcare staff should be very proud of the work and the effort and the experience they have applied to get us to this point. When I opened the stage one debate, I talked about the opportunities offered to us by this bill as a critical component in the safety and quality landscape. I very much appreciate the valuable work that the members of the Health and Sport Committee and health spokespeople from all parties have put into the bill at every stage. <clears throat> I know that whilst we may have disagreed at points, we all had a shared intention that this legislation should recognise the importance of dynamic workload assessment to inform professional judgment on skill mix and the needs to meet the demands of that workload and the critical importance in all of that of the clinical and professional voice. We all recognise the importance of that evidence-based approach founded on the needs of the patient or service user to contribute to our planning of the workforce, both locally and nationally. And I know we all wanted to see legislation that would work for the whole system across all the healthcare and care settings and would work for and be respectful of our key partners, be they professional bodies, local authorities or care providers. We agree high quality care is only possible when we recognise the importance of the multidisciplinary team and the valuable experience and expertise that each of the roles brings to that. Together with Miles Briggs and David Stewart, we've made significant changes to the bill, which set out that health boards have clear processes in place to allow those on the front line to carry out real-time assessment of staffing needs and effectively mitigate risks. The legislation we will put in place will ensure that the voice of the professional, be that the midwife and doctor on a busy labour ward, the nurse and the physiotherapist working together in the community, or the executive nurse and medical director at board level, will be heard and will influence staffing decisions. This legislation will promote a continuing culture of transparency engagement and engagement with staff, helping to create and sustain the, the conditions 
that staff need to use their experience and expertise to drive continuous improvement in our health and care services, whilst also always keeping the individual in receipt of that care at the centre of delivery. Of course, there is a great deal more work to come to ensure that the staffing method and tools for health settings are kept up to date with advances in the way care is delivered, to develop the multidisciplinary tools and to work with and support the care sector, local authority, third sector and private care providers to take the core methodology and build an approach that works for them. In this, there is learning from health to share with the care sector, but I am sure too that there will be learning from the care sector to share with health, and that is exactly as it should be. Presiding officer, in passing this bill, I firmly believe that we will be supporting our health and care staff to meet the commitment I know they deliver on every single day, to apply their skills, their expertise, and their compassion to deliver high quality, safe care, and to find ways to improve the way care is delivered, regardless of where it is delivered. And I am very pleased to move the motion in my name. I now call Miles Briggs for six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, this may sound a bit like an Oscar Awards speech to start with, because I'd like to start by thanking uh, a number of people and organisations um, who have helped. My own Scottish Conservative uh, research team, RCN Scotland, the Ally Allied Health Professionals Federation Scotland, COSLA, and Scottish Care and all those health, professional, uh, pr health professionals uh, who have contacted me. I'd also like to put on record my thanks to the Health and Sport Committee team, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government's Health and Care uh, Bills team as well. Presiding officer, Scottish Conservatives believe that the most valuable resource within our NHS is its people and we want the Health and Care Staffing Bill to do all that it can, can uh, to help them with their lives and jobs. My amendments therefore focused on the following themes to seek duty to seek clinical advice on staffing, improving real-time assessment and risk escalation procedures and improving staffing methods of care services. Scottish Conservatives believe that it's essential for the provisions within the bill and certainly the professional voice within the bill to be heard throughout uh, the legislation. That's therefore why my amendment 63 saw a duty to seek clinical advice. These amendments, I believe, ensure that the professional voice will be heard on vital sections of the bill, including the duty to ensure appropriate staffing, having arrangements in place to address severe and recurrent risks, ensuring adequate time is therefore given to clinical leaders in our NHS uh, for the training uh, they need, and that resources will follow that. And I believe the amendments will aid in the whole systems approach um, of the bill, as the Cabinet Secretary's outlined. The legislation needs to be as effective as it can possibly be, ensuring that the professional voice is heard throughout the bill, I believe, is a step forward in achieving this. In terms of improving real-time assessment and risk escalation procedures, uh, my amendments look towards how we can improve uh, the real-time assessment of these procedures. Um, the amendments therefore ensure that staff individuals with lead professional responsibility, for example, are trained and given the time and resources to identify and mitigate risk. For other employees, uh, the health board or agency um, are under a duty, therefore, to raise awareness of the escalation process and encourage staff to identify and report risks caused uh, by staffing uh, inefficiencies and real-time assessment being part of that. Scottish Conservatives put, therefore put forward numerous amendments to the bill which focused on staffing methods and care services. Throughout the evidence and discussions we had during the Health and Sport Committee around the bill, it was clear that there were real opportunities to develop tools in partnership uh, with the care sector, for example, and this was an important part of how I wanted to see the bill move forward, and I'm pleased uh, that my amendments will ensure that the appropriate people and organisations are involved in, therefore, uh, developing the tools in the future. I think it was also important for the whole Health and Sport Committee to recognise during the bill's consideration that a care setting is obviously sometimes someone's home and therefore it will require a different focus and staffing complement. I'm pleased that this is now recognised and I hope we'll see the progression of these tools as soon as possible when guidance uh, is brought forward because I do believe that there are opportunities with the bill to provide the care sector um, with opportunities which the acute sector will now have as well and I hope we progress those as soon as possible. 
Um, to conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, as I said at stage one uh, debate in Parliament, Scottish Conservatives recognise that our health and social care workforce faces a number of key challenges, with or without legislation. Unless we urgently resolve the staff shortages across NHS Scotland, safe staffing levels will remain a dream instead of a reality. I hope, therefore, that the Health and Care Staffing Bill will provide now a critical contribution to driving the necessarily Im necessary improvements um, around cultural and organisational change, and that we need to meet these challenges and, and expectations of health and social care staff across Scotland. We all agree around the principles and objectives of the bill to provide improvements to deliver safe, effective, person-centred services and outcomes for people as, across Scotland. What we need to now see is the Scottish Government making sure that we deliver upon these. Thank you. I now call Monica Lennon for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate the Cabinet Secretary and her officials, the Health and Sport Committee and the Committee Clerks, the Bills team, and indeed all of the organisations who have put so much work into um, not just driving the bill forward but improving the bill. Um, I think that's um, a great reflection on everyone here. And I know there's many people in, in the gallery who have followed the debate and I think in particular the RCN. So, so um, thank you for, for being here um, today. Um, Scottish Labour welcomes the bill as amended. Safe levels of staff for our health and social care staff um, is vital and we welcome all attempts to ensure that this happens. I don't think anyone has claimed that the bill is a, a panacea. Our NHS workforce is working under serious pressure and workforce planning has been poor. Scotland's fragile social care sector is facing a staffing and a funding crisis. So Scottish Labour continues to believe that the Scottish Government must urgently take action to address these ongoing issues. Scottish Labour, alongside many stakeholders, raised significant concerns about the bill at stage one. And we are pleased that the bill has been substantially improved since then. I'm pleased about the positive impact the Scottish Labour amendments will have for those working in the health and social care sector and ultimately those that they care for. It is important that NHS patients and people cared for by social care services are central to this bill. And this is a belief shared by staff who commit their working lives to the health and well-being of others. My Amendment 42 ensures that the guiding principles of the bill focus on the outcomes for service users. To have a positive impact, it is vital that workforce and workload planning are considered jointly. My amendments increase the public reporting requirements of the bill and together with Alison Johnston's amendments mean that the bill now takes into account workforce planning as well as workload planning. I'm glad that we've been successful in strengthening the links between this bill and national workforce planning. On robust risk assess assessment and escalation procedures, David Stewart's amendments um, will help to embed multidisciplinary uh, principles into the planning of staffing levels. Anna Sarwar's Amendment 47 ensures that there is a welcome cap in principle on agency fees and clearer information available on agency staff use. Workers in our social care sector do valuable and rewarding work, but they often face difficult working conditions with low pay and insecure work. My amendment aimed to ensure that social care staff would be paid at least the Scottish living wage, have secure hours and not be employed in zero hour contracts and would be reimbursed for travel, training and registration fees and uniform costs directly related to their work. And I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary agrees with me that social work terms and conditions must be drastically overhauled to improve the sustainability of the sector. And I'm pleased that these will now be included in guidance that will come before committee. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, Scottish Labour welcomes the Health and Care Staffing Bill. Any opportunity to ensure safe staffing for our vital health and care staff is backed by Scottish Labour. We welcome this legislation as a step towards fixing the workforce crisis in our health and social care services that see staff overworked and undervalued. However, my concerns remain that Scotland's health and social care workforce crisis will not be resolved by this bill alone. Our health and social care services need radical policy decisions backed up by investment to make real and sustainable change. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson for up to four minutes, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the numerous organisations who've provided briefings and for the support they've provided during stages two and three. Um, I'd like to thank the Royal College of Nursing, who, as Monica Lennon has said, are present in the gallery today and whose input has been invaluable throughout this process. And I'd also like to thank our allied health professionals and the Royal College of Midwives. And more importantly, I would like to thank all who work in health and social care for the work they do every day. And that's from consultant to cleaner. The Greens support the aims of the Health and Care Staffing Bill and we welcome this debate. As the Royal College of Nursing have said, it presents an opportunity to get the right number of staff with the right skills in the right place so that patients and residents receive safe and effective care. There is a clear link between safe staffing levels and the delivery of high quality health care. A study by Professor of Nursing Policy Anne-Marie Rafferty revealed that patients and nurses in hospitals with favourable patient-to-nurse ratios had consistently better outcomes than those in hospitals with less favourable ratios. And we're also supportive of the guiding principles for health and care staffing, such as respecting the dignity and the rights of service users, ensuring the well-being of staff and taking account of the views of staff and service users. We must do all we can to support those who are devoting their working lives to caring for Scotland's people. And it's, you know, we have carefully considered here how this legislation will impact them. And that is key because evidence coming from those currently working in health and care services emphasise that this legislation is timely, it's needed. The RCN Safe and Effective Staffing Report revealed that 51% of respondents reported a staffing shortfall on their last shift and 46% said they weren't able to provide the quality of care that they'd like to receive themselves if they were a patient. And likewise, the BMA conducted a survey of doctors which showed that 62% felt that a lack of doctors and rota gaps were affecting their ability to deliver safe patient care. And a 2018 Scottish Care report revealed that 77% of the care homes surveyed had vacancies. So these stark figures stress that the protections introduced by this bill are vital to the delivery of safe and high quality patient care. We need to continue to strive for real integration we must give the care sector the attention we give the NHS. Um, while not pushed, I welcome Monica Lennon's amendments to improve conditions for those working in this sector. So welcome opportunity to raise these important issues. The most recent statistics show that 5.1% of nursing and midwifery posts and 4.9% of allied health profession posts are vacant. Now, while these figures represent an increase in staffing levels from the previous years, six territorial NHS boards reported a reduction in qualified nursing and midwifery staff in post. So there's st there is still considerable disparity between health boards that needs to be addressed. Um, as she did when Cabinet Secretary for Social Security, Jean Freeman has worked hard to seek cross-party input and consensus, and I do appreciate that. We need a well-staffed NHS, both for patients and for those working in it. Workload and workforce are inextricably linked. Working in an overstretched, overstressful environment is not sustainable. Finally, this bill alone will not create more health and care professionals. It won't address the fundamental shortages being experienced across the sector. However, it is a starting point. Work must continue to make sure that Scotland has the health and care staff it needs. I am certain, however, that it will play a key role in ensuring that our health and social care services are appropriately staffed and that staff can deliver the best standards of patient care. Thank you. Call Alex Cole Hamilton for four minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. In the margins of this meeting in private today, the Cabinet Secretary confided in me that she was looking for another consensus bill, and I think in this she's found that, and I congratulate her for the achievement. She worked very hard between stage two and this stage to reach accommodation on a range of uh, tensions that existed at stage two, and I think she's achieved that. I'd also like to pay tribute to Kirsty Williams, who is a, a Liberal Democrat Assembly member, um, who stewarded a, a very similar bill through the Welsh Assembly, and it is uh, her guidance I've lent into in terms of the understanding of that. I too would like to thank the clerks and all the witnesses in the stage one process, and in particular the RCN, who started briefing members of our committee some two and a half years ago on what they'd like to see uh, happen today. So I hope that they are pleased, particularly Sarah Atherton, who's a friend and colleague of long standing, who, who was 
readily available with some of the technical briefings that I think we all, as uh, newcomers to some aspect of this, uh, lent very heavily on. But also those allied health professionals as well, because I think for, um, from the outset, this bill needed to be slightly more than it was when originally drafted. And it recognises the new strata in which we deliver both health and social care, that there is a multidisciplinary focus like never before, that actually the integration of health and social care means that we need to be thinking out of silos and recognise that what might apply to a clinical staff team might also apply to a social care staff team as well. Um, Alison Johnston referenced that very scary survey about the, the attitudes and the beliefs of staff in terms of the views that they have about patient care being compromised on the very last shift that they did. Now, obviously, there will be a resource imperative around that as well, but this bill does do something to giving the staff the tools that they require to ensure that they are not, uh, adequately staffed, not just for the safety of their patients, but also for the safety of each other and uh, the staff cohort as well. And there is much about this bill that matters. The, the voice of uh, practitioners and nurses on the ground who understand the wards that they occupy and the very specific needs of those wards, that they are heard. This gives them the facility to do that. Expertise matters in planning and understanding what a shift and a dynamic shift environment looks like, and making your staff assure your staff accordingly, but also that you're planning for risk as well. And also that staff have faith in the process, that their views will be listened to. And in, you know, in, in normal times, that might just be in ensuring that from the grassroots, ideas uh, around improving staffing are listened to and taken forward and extrapolated across the NHS. But at the more serious end of the spectrum, that whistleblowers will be treated uh, well and dealt with appropriately as well. And that touches on this as well, because the clauses of this bill that we pass into law today will see changes felt in the quiet wards across our NHS and the noisy ones too. Um, giving senior staff, I think, the time and the space to get their head around the planning and the overview of uh, the, the wards and the, the areas of work in which they find themselves, I think is one of the most significant and most important changes that we've enacted in this bill. And I congratulate Alison Johnson for securing those amendments. I think it will give that important strategic overview which will enhance both staff safety and patient safety as well. Um, I think allowing change to germinate from the grassroots works in any organisation and the NHS and our social care structure and our allied healthcare professionals are no different and this, this gives them the opportunity to do that. At first reading, presiding officer, this bill was about a toolkit but it is so much more than that and it's been great to be part of the process of its development, not least to hear about where this will take our workforce but more importantly a reminder of the importance and the commitment of the workforce that this will serve because they do so much for us it's about time we start doing something for them and in these pages of this bill we achieve something of that thank you move now to the open debate and we have one speaker is it emma harper for around four minutes please thank you presiding officer um the Health and Care Staffing Bill has been one bill that I have enjoyed working on since joining the Health and Sport Committee. The aim of the bill is set out in the policy memorandum is to provide a statutory basis for the provision of appropriate staffing in health and care settings, thereby enabling staff uh, uh, to provide safe and high quality care and improve outcomes for all patients and service users. The provision of high quality care requires the right people in the right place with the right skills at the right time to ensure the best health and care outcomes for service users and people experiencing care. And I fully agree with this and I know that the amendments moved by the government as well as by colleagues across chamber will allow this aim to be achieved. It's obvious that members have engaged in a process which has achieved cross chamber agreement. We discussed staffing tools, continuous professional development, issues around case holding and non-case holding of senior charge nurses and many other issues related to acute and community care and uh, the requirement of the involvement of a multidisciplinary team approach to provide appropriate health and care staffing. And I'm pleased that amendments 18, 18A and 18B were agreed. We had wide debate at stage two in the committee 
and the Cabinet Secretary has provided a, an excellent example of team working in Shetland, which requires it, the, the local teams to be actually case holders as well. And I'd like to offer just one other example of that when senior charges, charge nurses often do provide direct patient care, such as in the perioperative environment, where uh, surgery is uh, extended, complications occur, and you might need the experience or the expertise of a senior charge nurse to be able to step in and provide the immediate care assistance that needed when somebody's belly is open on the operating table. So um, I'd like to thank everybody who provided evidence to the committee, whether... <laughs> I'd like to provide uh, to thank everybody who provided evidence to the committee, whether written or, or in the evidence sessions. It was all well informed and helped committee members come to informed conclusions. The committee clerks and support from Spice, the Spice team should also be commended. And uh, Miles Briggs has mentioned all the, the people who provided evidence for us uh, in the committee. So I'm grateful to all the organisations who provided briefings for the bill, which helped inform the debate. I've had lots of phone calls, direct advice from the RCN and chief nursing officers at both NHS and Friesen Galloway and Ayrshire and Arran and representatives from Scottish Care. I was a new MSP for South Scotland when the First Minister announced the Scottish Government's intention to enshrine safe, safe staffing into law at the Royal College of Nursing Congress in Glasgow in 2016. And as a new MSP, I had been providing direct patient care just about a month before that, actually. And in my work as a nurse educator and as a perioperative nurse, with 30 years of experience in America, in England and Scotland, it's helped inform me in the scrutiny of the proposed bill at committee stage. Um, one example that I have is that for 30 years, 30 years ago, we had 19 gale wards where uh, there was rows of beds up either side of the wards which certainly had some positives when it was looking at staffing, but there were also negatives as well, which include no personal private space, curtains are not walls, every voice and every noise is heard when you're looking after patients in a multi-room occupancy. So, presiding officer, this bill enables a rigorous evidence-based approach to decision-making on staffing that is safe and effective. The bill takes account of the health and care needs of patients and service users, assists the exercise of professional judgment and promotes a safe environment for both patients and staff. Scotland is leading the UK in our groundbreaking evidence-based approach to nursing and midwifery workload and workforce planning. The bill also puts in place a framework to support the systematic identification of the workload needed to improve outcomes and deliver high quality care. In bringing forward this bill, the Scottish Government, aided by experts from across health and social care, has understood the workload that is generated by any given setting and circumstance, and therefore the skills that are required and the staff mix that will provide them. I'd like to again thank all those who provided evidence in the committee and thank all the members of health and care across Scotland because they do do a fantastic job every day. Thank you. Move now to the closing speeches and I call David Stewart for around four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This has uh, been an excellent, albeit short and snappy, uh, debate, and uh, there have been a lot of insightful and well informed speeches from across the chamber. Uh, and I was, uh, President Officer, impressed to see how many SNP backbenchers were here, because I understand that last night was their Christmas party, so I'm very impressed with their dedication <laughs> in turning up. However, I do understand there was a bit of a run in paracetamol from the local shop, but I won't, I won't go there. Um, so, as a member of the Health and Sport Committee, um, I was present and took an active part in questioning of all our witnesses, which included the Cabinet Secretary at an earlier stage. I'm being heckled by Poseidon officer behind me. Uh, but if I could paraphrase the conclusion of our stage one report, no one can object to the guiding principles of the Bill, having the right people with the right skills in the right place at the right time to ensure the highest quality of care. And as Monica Lennon made clear, Labour supports the general principles of the Bill, but as Alison Johnson and Alec Cole Hamilton also made clear, there were some areas of concern, but I really believe that the cross-party consensus on amendments strengthened the Bill. And as I said earlier, I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary, and hope that doesn't damage her career, um, for her consensual and helpful role in assuming that we have uh, amendments that work for everyone. Uh, so the Cabinet Secretary, in response to the Health Committee Stage 1, 
uh, report said the bill is about workload planning, not workforce planning. So, but Scottish Labour believes that health and social care policy should be focused on achieving the best outcomes for people and protecting staff wellbeing. And as Kozlov argued, the overlines in the, perhaps in the past uh, on bureaucratic box ticking exercises have not been helpful. Hopefully we can avoid this. And also we should raise lessons from history and learn lessons from history. And as was raised before, President Officer, the Francis report into bullying and whistleblowing in NHS England, concluding that losing trained talent from the NHS led to inadequate staffing levels and poor quality of care. And as the Cabinet Secretary knows well, there will be a statement on Thursday, which uh, Monica Lynn and I will be contributing to. And I'm sure the Francis report will be picked up by the current report that the Cabinet Secretary has set up. Conscious of time, President Officer, and people anxious to get away. But in conclusion, I believe that all members in this chamber today uh, recognise the commitment and dedication of our hard-working frontline staff. Um, and just to correct a uh, small amendment to my earlier comments, I think I said Christmas party, but of course I was a little bit, uh, a little bit early for that, but it was a party nevertheless. Yeah. And don't let anyone say that I never correct the record design officer when I'm wrong. Um, as David Oliver, a consultant in geriatrics, said in the uh, BMJ recently, um, without adequate staffing and clinical roles, NHS performance uh, will decline and services will become unsustainable. Morale will worsen and staff will leave or choose to do less, a vicious circle. The workforce is surely the most pressing existential threat. And in the short time I've got available, um, I would make a key point that you cannot legislate staff into existence, uh, but I do believe that the cross-party consensus on amendments has strengthened and improved the bill, and that's the nature of this place, to make sure that legislation is better. There are much bigger issues which I don't have time to comment on, President Officer, uh, such as demand forecasting for future planning, the management of predictive training for frontline staff, the effect of Brexit, which is going to be disastrous in my view in NHS employment, the effect of the bullying culture in some areas may have in retention, and of course there's a very strong rural element that someone from Highlands Lands would of course argue. So the um, amended bill is a step in the right direction, which Labour will support, and as Nye Bevan, the uh, founder of NHS, said that the NHS will survive as long as there's folk left with faith to fight for it. Thank you, President Officer. I uh, call Brian Whittle for around four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. And I'm uh, pleased to close this important and consensual uh, debate on behalf of the uh, Scottish Conservatives. And Deputy Presenting Officer, when we were first considering a bill entitled Health and Care Staffing, originally called Safe Staffing, I believe most would instinctively think it entirely sensible. Of course, ensuring that there are appropriate numbers of suitably trained staff in place is an entirely reasonable objective. But as we've heard today in the presentations from across the chamber and, and an ongoing scrutiny of the bill in the Health and Sport Committee, there were some crucial questions that, that were raised uh, as it was developed. Uh, for example, in setting appropriate numbers of staff, it's, um, it's important that the meaning of the term appropriate staff is properly defined and is unambiguous. Also, what actions will be taken if the appropriate staffing levels are not met? Again, this has got to be properly defined so that NHS boards and care sector know exactly what they are working to. I think given the multidisciplinary nature of healthcare teams, uh, we, we need to ask if the bill is drafted in such a way as to include all facets of healthcare. I think the Health and Sport Committee took evidence and questioned the Cabinet Secretary around the need to, de uh, to develop workforce tools and how we would address this. I think the technology required to implement the bill uh, uh, as intended, it is still not available. And given that the workforce planning tools currently do not include all the healthcare, uh, and healthcare professional and care disciplines, in fact, I think the, the evidence was suggesting it was limited more to nursing and midwifery. And these tools are currently uh, bolted on to the payroll platform. Uh, when I questioned the Cabinet Secretary in the committee, uh, she did suggest that that technology required including the following development of workforce planning tools and potentially developing a platform which they sit was under consideration. I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary in sum, summing up would confirm this. Um, I have to say, though, although the specifications of the tools required and the integrity of the platform in which they sit, I think should have been scoped out at the outset of the bill. But without a properly considered and implemented technical solution, the Safe Staffing Bill it risks falling short of its, its intentions. With all of this in mind, it's, it's, uh, if, if all of this is not considered, the staffing bill uh, is in danger of becoming no more than window dressing and adding uh, to a lengthy list of non-actionable and actionable targets. 
I think there is that need, as, as Miles, Briggs, Miles Briggs amendments have said, to strengthen the reporting requirements on health boards to ensure proper scrutiny, especially given the call uh, for clinical advice to be sought as a prerequisite on staffing bills. But under, underpinning all of this, of course, is the issue of staffing retention and recruitment. It has been raised across the chamber uh, by several members. members. I think the health care and staffing bill in and of itself cannot make the differences intended. Without the overall appropriate numbers of staff, it's obvious the ability to ensure appropriate staffing at any one time will be impaired by general shortages of staff. As the Royal College of, of Physicians state, and as Dave Stewart stated, we cannot legislate doctors into existence. Uh, and with a projected shortfall of doctors in Scotland, it would be difficult to argue that this won't have an impact on the potential of the bill. Uh, Outcomes uh, were uh, highlighted by the Cabinet Secretary and in general we were looking for improved services for patients and improved quality of working environment for NHS uh, care, uh, staff and care staff and improved work-life balance for NHS and our care staff. And I think that's why I was very uh, uh, pleased to see Alison Johnson's amendment in there. And we spoke in committee on the importance of time uh, uh, for frontline staff for CPD. And um, without this, the implementation of the bill will not happen and we've always stated that we are looking that looking after the health of our healthcare professionals is important in delivering a quality healthcare service and it speaks to absenteeism and retention. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservatives uh, will uh, be supporting this bill obviously, recognising that it should not be seen as a panacea, rather that success will rely on progress being made in other areas as well, especially around the swift development of appropriate technology and data analysis. The need to give professionals a strong voice in the staffing process and tackling the not insignificant challenges of retention and recruitment. Deputy Presiding Officer. I call Jane Freeman to wind up the debate for five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank members for their contribution to this debate? Can I say to Mr. Stewart, uh, I'm glad you corrected the record, but you know, on these benches, we're always up for a wee party, so I'm sure we'll have more than one. Um, but can I also uh, thank him for making the very important point, which was that our role here in this chamber and as MSPs, as parliamentarians, is to make the best law that we can uh, and to make legislation that is appropriate to the needs of our country. And I believe uh, in this bill, that is exactly what we are doing. Uh, as I said when I opened this debate, I am immensely proud of the work carried out by our health and care staff to ensure not just that the quality of care is consistent, but that it is high quality care and improving care. This legislation will improve the experience of the patient, drive the improvement of outcomes and recognises that it is people and citizens delivering that patient experience and patient care. It provides a balanced, evidence-based approach to supporting patients, professionals and organisational outcomes. But as members have noted, and as I have made clear on many occasions, there is no single thing that we do to ensure safe, effective, person-centred care, but a number of important steps that we need to take. And so this legislation is the next important piece that sits alongside our Scottish Patient Safety Programme, our Excellence in Care work, uh, in order to ensure that we continue to drive uh, our commitment to ensure that we have safe and effective patient care. Now, there are, of course, and I need to mention them, a number of important steps that we need to take next. Uh, the important work of making this legislation come alive to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland and create conditions where our staff can flourish continues now for the development of guidance as the next step in the journey. That guidance will be drafted in collaboration with all stakeholders and will, of course, be shared with our Health and Sport Committee. It's also worth noting that there will be regulations laid for every new staffing tool developed and that these will be developed uh, and subject to affirmative procedure, thereby allowing further scrutiny by members across this chamber to ensure that they meet uh, the intention and the principles behind this bill. Uh, it is also worth saying, just before I conclude on this part, uh, to Mr uh, Whittle, uh, that I completely take his point in terms of digital. There is a great deal of work going on in health uh, on digital platforms, and I make the offer to the Health and Sport Committee uh, to come forward in due course and explain and present all of that work so you can see where we are. 
Presiding officer, um, it is appropriate for me to conclude with a number of thank yous uh, uh, for support in this uh, legislation and taking us to this point where we do have, uh, I believe, a significant and important piece of legislation that we are, I hope, about to all agree on. Can I thank the Allied Health Professions Federation of Scotland, Royal College of Midwives, Royal College of Nursing, BMA, the Medical Royal Colleges, COSLA, Unison, staff group representatives, Scottish Care and representatives of integration authorities. That is an indication of the importance of this legislation that all of these organisations actively contributed with members to uh, what we have before us today. I also want to thank the Health and uh, Sport Committee, DPLR and Finance Committees too for the contribution that they have made in the development of this uh, legislation as we've gone through all the stages. And finally, in my thank yous, I really must thank uh, the Bill team uh, for this piece of legislation whose work has been extensive, has been driven by experience, direct frontline experience and expertise, who has been unstinting and without whom uh, I am pretty certain we would not be where we are right at this moment. All of this takes us together with a shared commitment across this chamber to get this right. For those who work in our health and social care sectors, they deserve nothing less. Our patients deserve nothing less. Those who use our care services deserve nothing less. And I very much look forward to continuing the shared work with members across this chamber as we take the next steps to make this important legislation a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 17152 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau, setting out a revised business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if no one wishes to speak on the motion, the question is that motion 17152 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And I am minded to accept a motion under Rule 11.2.4 of standing orders that decision time be brought forward to now. Could I call on Graham Day to move such a motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. So the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So we turn to decision time, and there is only one question today. The question is that motion 17127, in the name of Jean Freeman, on the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill, be agreed. And as this is a bill, we will move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17127 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes, 113. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill is agreed, is passed. <laughs> that concludes decision time. I now close this meeting. <laughs>